Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you for joining us. As we are uh, here for the uh, Warner Media Lift Every Voice and Unblock the Vote event, and I'm so happy to uh, be having this conversation with several experts uh, on the history of voter voting rights in this country, on the present day challenges that we face and where this could all be headed. Um, I want to introduce our panelists now. We've got Riley Bunch, who's a public policy reporter at Georgia Public Broadcasting. She covers uh, the intersection of government and daily life uh, there in Georgia, where I know many of you are as well. And she also covers Georgia's congressional delegation and statewide uh, officials and the general assembly. Assembly. We are also joined by Dr. Greer, who is an, ass a, an assistant professor of political science in the Department of Political Science at Clark Atlanta University. Uh, Dr. Greer is, researches community and civic involvement and focuses on how public policy has hacked on historically underserved communities. And she researches how public policymakers can make people's lives better uh, through the lens of policy. And last but not least, we have Isaiah Thomas, who really needs no in introduction, uh, an NBA Hall of Famer, a, a Turner uh, sports analyst, a businessman, uh, an activist, uh, all of these things, uh, all three of you, thank you all so much for being here um, and for doing this event. And I feel like every single year, it's always the most opportune time to talk about these issues because voting has been front and center for all of us. If you live in Atlanta, Georgia, as many of you do, if you live elsewhere in the country, it is one of the, the most um, controversial topics in American politics and civic life today. And so I do want to start in Georgia because I think that, you know, I've been calling it the center of the political universe because I think that that's really where this is all coming to a head. Uh, Georgia in particular is also the, you know, the birthplace of the civil rights movement. So it's it's no surprise that you have both um, what seems to be uh, an enormous push toward uh, voter suppression efforts and the pushback from activists who are saying, we've seen this show before. So Riley, can you just give us a sense, what is the sense on the ground about how people who live in Georgia feel uh, about their voting rights? Do they feel like it's under attack? Well, it's hard because we see these two very dueling narratives in Georgia, and I don't think there was a day that the state was out of the headlines during the 2020 election. We had this huge momentum from the Democratic Party and enthusiasm on the ground from voters having sending two senators to the Senate, winning control of that chamber and, and Congress, right? And they, these were huge wins for the Democratic Party that was gaining this momentum over years and years and years. But at the same time, we have this other and powerful narrative of the state legislature, right, which is um, cracking down on the voting system in the wake of the 2020 election. A Republican held majority in the state has put a lot of restrictions and changes in the way Georgians vote um, in the wake of the 2020 election and the high turnout. They cite the pandemic, pandemic, but we know that a lot of these changes have been fueled by lies and widespread allegations of, of voter fraud, right? So it, it was so, so interesting to see Democratic voters on the ground have so much enthusiasm and so much hope for the future, make these huge wins, but in the aftermath have this big crackdown by the General Assembly. So it's, it's definitely a, a tale of state and federal control over the voting system. Um, I remember covering this election going into 2020 and, and covering all the different election changes and, and getting a lot of concern from activists and Democrats that their that Democratic voters would be deterred from voting because maybe they didn't trust vote by mail. Maybe they didn't um, couldn't keep up with all the various changes due to COVID. And what we actually ended up seeing was just an enormous surge of engagement from voters who really come hell or high water, came out and cast their ballots. Um, but despite that, you know, D Dr. Greer, I want to ask you about the history here. There have been a lot of people saying that these voting laws, let's say the one in Georgia in particular, and many others, dozens of others that are being enacted around the country, they're calling it the new Jim Crow. You are a political scientist, um, someone who has a keen sense of the history. 
fact check that for us. Do you think that we are encroaching on that same kind of territory with the way that these voting rights bills are being pushed and what they are intended to do? No. And the reason I say no, and I say no very quickly, is because um, during Jim Crow, the electorate was not able to have a say-so at the ballot box. Um, Most Black and Brown people did not have full citizenship, which means the ability to cast a ballot um, during Jim Crow. And to to say that we are there um, does not, takes away that we have full citizenship at this moment. It's important for us to be clear that the state legislature in Georgia and in every other state in the union is able to change voting laws because those individuals were voted in by the electorate. It is um, it is known that state and local elections have the lowest ver- voter turnout than presidential election. It is known that midterm elections have a, a tremendously low turnout. And because the universal we do not fully and actively participate particularly during midterm elections, particularly during the elections where the the legislature in your particular state is on the ballot, because we don't pay attention to those aspects, to those elections, then that legislature is able to pass the laws based on those that participate. And I think we have to take full ownership in that, that we as citizens have the ability to create the laws that that most benefit the masses. We as the electorate, because of the ability to vote, have the power within us to participate, to change who the governor is, to change who the legislature is, to um, create those policies that most benefit those um, in the masses. And when we don't really take ownership of that, and when we make assumptions that people who are in government, who who may not have been representing you well, will all of a sudden do the right thing, does a disservice not only to us, it also does a disservice to generations to come. That's such an important point um, that people have to vote, not just in presidential elections, but in other elections that actually may have more um, more impact on their day-to-day lives. And, you know, Isaiah, I wanna ask you about this because there are two sides to how the sports world um, could, does, should engage in these issues. There is on the one hand, uh, pushing back against voter suppression. And then on the other hand, it's exactly what Dr. Greer is talking about, encouraging people to actually participate in the election cycle. Um, you can, reduce the barriers to entry to voting, but if people don't actually vote, what's the point? So I, I wanna ask, like, what do you see the role of the sports community is in um, in engaging with the broader public on this? Because we all know they have an enormous amount of influence. I mean, more people are really watching um, the NBA and the NFL and, and our sports leagues than they are watching, um, you know, the the, evening news. So what's the role here? What And what are you already seeing that people are doing uh, to help influence this issue? You know, I, I would I would like to, you know, echo the, the universe of we uh, in terms of participating in democracy and, and not only participating in it, but also inspiring and educating about the system that we live in and how we're governed and how it truly works. And and what we can do in sport, because we do have uh, the, the the boom mic, so to speak, uh, where we we can speak for the voiceless. Uh, because every night we are we are interviewed. Every night we are we are spoken to. So it's 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 really up to us to to really speak for the communities that we come from, uh, and and not only speak for those communities but really speak to try to inspire others to participate and also continue to educate about what's happening in this democracy, what's happening in this America, how we're classified and and what what our powers can truly be by coming together and voting for all specific interests. Uh, 
Uh, you know, it's, when we talk about race uh, in sport, when we think about race, uh, we, we think of competition. Uh, you know, our, our group against your group, right? And, and who moves uh, collectively together to win. Uh, but outside of sport, what we find uh, in, in our everyday society, our black and brown communities have lost the collective we to participate in the race. Uh, and when, when we talk about race, it has two definitions. There's race in terms of competition, and then there's race in, in terms of the way the, uh, the American society works. I'm going to I'm going to probe you on that a little bit more. You said the the African American community has lost the sense of collective we. So, do you think that today that there is less of um you know a universal sense that we are all pushing rowing in the same direction is that a bad thing? Uh <laughs> is that something that was characteristic of past eras that uh, be out of necessity, I'm I'm curious if you could just speak more to that. It, it, it's it's a very nuanced question here because in the, in the political system, the way we are classified and grouped, uh, you know, by the census every you know ten or so years, I've I've lived long enough to be you know classified as as Negro, uh, Afro American, African American, Black, Brown, uh, people of color, uh, and you know the the Hispanic, the Asian, the, the white community, they collectively pool their resources and they, and they work in this race economically to support each other. Whereas the African-American community, Afro-American, Afro-American, Afro-American black community, we have, we sometimes, we, we don't come together collectively to pool our resources economically, whether it be in voting, whether it be in participating in each other's businesses, uh, you know, it's a it's an economic race as well as a, a a race for equality, and and these are the things that we have to universally, collective, we talk about and continue to discuss. Where I believe, uh, you know, in the, in the in the early parts of when we were all declassified out of our nationalities, put into these colored boxes, there was a a, a universal we that spoke about how we collectively, you know, gain rights, voting rights, equal rights, economic rights in this political system. We have lost that participation and educational uh, unity in terms of moving forward. That's my belief. Dr. Greer, I, I want you to come in on this because um, the reason I asked that question is about uh, strategy. People are joining us today in part to find out what happens next, where do we go next? And I do think we can learn from the past about how to understand the present and act in the future. In the past, in the face of voter suppression in the South, there was an enormous political and social effort to raise awareness about the situation and change the laws, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. Um, why are those efforts, perhaps similar efforts today, failing? Um, do you see big differences that we can that can help us understand what's happening now? Actually, it's uh, interesting you should ask the question because this is my uh, new venture that I hopefully am turning into a book, and it is um, specifically about um, how one can move from protest to actual policy. Um, and part of that effort is, um, number one, yes, understanding historical strategies and tactics at the same time um, that there needs to be some change when it comes to today, when it comes to some of those tactics. Um, number two, um, it's important for us to understand that um, in the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s, it was about having access to the ballot box while you had the economic and social and living conditions uh, may, not, may not have been addressed during that time. Um, now you have access to the ballot, yet from a social, from a um, economic standpoint, we are failing in those aspects where you see um, mostly black and brown areas having challenges with having clean water or air pollution, healthcare disparity, uh, food insecurity and the like. 
So what is different and, and perhaps what needs to come together is that there tends to be um, a camp now where we want to, uh, or we're repeating messages of victimization and disenfranchisement that may not be there um, when it comes to access to the ballot box. That's a matter of educating us. Um, so for example, one could argue that when it comes to the state of Georgia, in urban areas in particular, in urban and suburban areas, um, the new voting laws in Georgia actually is helpful because it expands access to the ballot, particularly on weekends. There are mandatory weekends, whereas before, depending on your county, um, then your county can select uh, whether or not um, you can vote on weekends, how long on weekends and such. Now you have that access. So here in Georgia, you have three weeks of early voting, um, one mandatory uh, weekend that every county has to obey by, and then another one that the county can choose. So there is that opportunity there. The question is, are we educating each other enough, not only about structures of government, as Mr. Thomas noted, also about the specific issues? Um, we, I, you know, in, in the research that I'm conducting, it's important to have an umbrella where you have a universal message and what those message, what that message is that we can, we, the majority can agree upon. And then understanding that when it comes to a particular state or municipality to customize those particular items that goes along with your particular state or city. Because what works in Georgia is not going to work in Florida. It's not going to work in Montana. And that's okay. However, are we clear on what the end goal looks like? And then can we customize strategies in order to get to that end goal? We have not come together on a unified goal, let alone how to get a strategy together to meet those goals. It, um, there is so much disagreement um, about exactly what you discussed, Dr. Greer, about specifically in Georgia, and I'm focusing a lot on Georgia because I do think that is one of the core places where this battle is being fought out and where, in fact, um, some of the um, changes being made for good or for bad are being exported to other parts of the country. Um, but there were some improvements as you pointed out, uh, weekend voting, uh, the, some of the worst parts of the Georgia bill were actually taken out uh, in part due to public outcry. And so the final product wasn't as bad as people anticipated. But there was one element of the Georgia bill that that still to this day um, is a source of in enormous concern because it's about um, it's fundamentally about who controls elections and removing that control from local uh, people and moving it to a partisan, um, you know, a partisan group at the state level. And that's one of the things that a lot of people are looking at in Georgia. Will Republicans try to um, hypothetically overtake, for example, the Fulton County Edu um, Elections Board and um, under the guise of trying to reform the board and try to uh, basically put in place their own election rules and regulations. And Riley, um, this is something that I know Georgia reporters are following um, pretty closely. How likely do you think that really is? I mean, Republicans say that that's hyperbole, that this is not going to happen, that they're not going to take over the board and close uh, polling sites and uh, take people off the voting rolls. But do you think it's a valid concern? And, um, and you know, how is it playing out right now in Georgia? Well, I think it's absolutely a valid concern because they set up this process in the first place, right? You know, you, you mentioned, Abby, that this was a provision in a bill that did not get a lot of attention out of the 98 pages that was the, the new elections law in Georgia, right? There was a lot of other provisions that got more attention, but this particular one that gave the state election board kind of this authority to move in to do reviews of local elections um, boards and the systems that they run in counties is, is definitely a concern, right? Because we talk about state control of the election systems, but who is really carrying out the elections? And that's your local boards and your, your local poll workers and, and elections, um, county elections leaders, right? So having the 
the ability for the Republican legislature to uh, appoint um, people on the state election board who can then appoint a panel to review a specific county election. You know, they set up this process for a reason and, and it is taking quite a bit of time that we already have a review panel looking at Fulton County, which has historically had a lot of problems with how it's run um, a lot because it is such a major county, right? We had our elections supervisor there, Richard Barron, he resigned at, after the 2020 election. It is very embattled, but this review process is taking a long time they, they say it's a last resort, Republicans say it's a last resort, but they set this process up for a reason and it was in the bill for a reason. And it's taking a long time, but my understanding is that it could be done before the um, general election this year. So it could be coming to a head pretty quickly, right? Absolutely. And depending on if they enact this takeover, if they kind of appoint their own people to run this election, it, it, you, you could have politically motivated actors running um, a local election, right, in Fulton County, um, which could they change things and how it works. They have the power to do so. So it could have big impacts on the, the 2022 election. Yeah. Um, to me, this is one of the like you said, when this happened, very few people paid attention to it. And I don't know if it's because it, they found it confusing to understand. But I mean, the bottom line is um, there are efforts being made by people who believe the last election was stolen to create legal mechanisms to potentially steal the next election. Like that is actually happening out there um, in the world. And it's some of the mechanisms are um, potentially what you're seeing in Georgia. But in other states, it's even more um out, you know, it's even more egregious. It, you know, it, it's simply just um, taking away local control of elections and giving it to, um, you know, partisan figures at the state level. So that's definitely something for, I think, everyone to, to be on the lookout for. Um, but I want to ask about, um, you know, there is so much concern. And I think Dr. Greer, I actually really agree with you, frankly, that there's probably a lack of prioritization of things that are real concerns versus things that are less of less concern. Um, but at the same time, if the goal is to improve access to the ballot in general across the board, make it easier to vote, perhaps modernize voting, bringing voting into the 21st century, um, I, uh, Isaiah, I wanted to ask you, I mean, do you think that there is a role that professional sports organizations can play in pushing that conversation forward? Um, you know, there actually was a lot of backlash in Georgia when they were considering an earlier version of this voter voting bill. And you did have sports leagues speaking out. But, you know, do you think more should be done to when it comes to sports organizations, which are at the end of the day, businesses to weigh in here and say, we want to operate in states and in places where there are minimums for access to the ballot. Absolutely. Um, you know, sport, sport has a way of, 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 of inspiring uh, participation, but also it, it has a way of dispensing information and, and I and, and and as I listen, uh, I, I take the sports analogy, uh, and 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 keep coming back to in politics. They like to say it's political sport, where it is competition, and you have you have one group that's fighting to to make it best for them, and and you have another group that may not be participating at all, and we may be complaining, but not necessarily showing up participating, getting the information, and making ourselves present and known and fighting for what it is that we believe in and how we want our system, this democratic American system to work. We have to participate. And if we don't participate, you can either participate or complain. And in sport, when you don't participate and you don't compete, then you get beat. And, and, and we need to, in sport, what we can do is dispense information. You know, we, we, we have Republicans, we have Democrats at the game, we have black, white, uh, you know, all different colors, all different, you know, races, religion. 
they all come together in, in one spot for two and a half hours and they root for the team in red or they root for the team in white. And what we can do in sport is continue to participate and dispense information and try to inspire everyone to continue to participate in this thing we call democracy in America. Um, so Dr. Greer, that's a, a great segue. The analogy is, is I think, great, which is that um, you got to just, you have to play in order to win. Um, and, I, and at the end of the day, <laughs> and at the end of the day, you got to win too. Um, and I do wonder, Dr. Greer, I mean, I think back to um, we have this at, uh, on CNN, we have an LBJ series um, on Lyndon B. Johnson airing now, and I'll be doing an event on Wednesday, which you should check out. You can find information on my Twitter. But um, Dr. King, who worked very closely with Lyndon B. Johnson on the strategy and the tactics of, of um, passing voting rights legislation, was keenly aware that it would not be possible without getting a President Johnson, more power, more power, meaning more political power in Washington to get the thing done. And I'm wondering, is there enough attention in your mind to that aspect of this? If you don't like the way that voting laws are, are enough people who want to change the status quo focused on the fact that in a state like Georgia, Democrats don't have enough political power to prevent these things from happening. And in a lot of states, they don't have enough political power to stop the bad stuff from happening. Is enough attention being paid to that? Um, so first, I want to say before I forget, so you must have been looking at my notes because I was going to reference the <laughs> LGV, uh, um I was going to reference it because I say to my students often that um, LBJ said to MLK reportedly, if you want me to pass it, make me, right? Make me. And, and how, how, do, how did that make me come about? And it came about because there was political pressure, as you said, in order to get it done. Um, part of, are, is there enough people focused on it? The answer is no. Um, and I say no because some will say, yes, there is. At the same time, the way that the messaging is focused is focused on what is being taken away versus what do we do to move forward. If we continuously use the VS phrase, which I really don't like to say, so I'm a whisper it, voter suppression. If we continuously say that particular phrase, then what we're doing is telling groups of people who already have low political efficacy, who already have some distrust of government, that they don't want you to do it anyway. So why even try? Why even do anything? Why open your mouth? Why try to say anything, do anything? Because it's not going to make a difference. That is what we need to move away from if we want more of us to participate in the system. So the educating, when is early voting? How do you um, vote early? Um, what is the deadline for requesting your ballot? Why is there a deadline to request your ballot to make sure that it gets turned in on time through the mail, right? If there is a holistic understanding, a holistic appreciation, then perhaps we can change it to where we get more people to use a sports analogy off the bench and to get them in the game so that so that there is competition. Part of the reason why Georgia is, you know, the center of U.S. political world right now is because more people are getting off the bench and they're getting into the game. And so you see um, those who are opposed to this new competition fighting back really, really hard where they didn't have to at first, right? They're getting more and more on the defense. If, if those that are getting into the game get on offense more, get more of you know, their fans in to rally around, to shout their names, to call in, to advocate for these particular policies, then you can see political wins, again, where the masses are able to benefit, 
sitting on the sidelines is not helping us. Complaining on the sidelines isn't helping. We have to get into the game. And again, we have full citizenship and we should use that. So, so many great points there. So many great points there. So Riley, um, I want to ask you about um, when you talk to, because you cover the state legislature, and I'm curious, when you talk to the lawmakers who, um, as a reaction to the last election are passing new voting laws, what is the rationale for for that? And do you buy it? I think we have to think about the terms that they use. So one one big buzzword term that we hear from Republican lawmakers at the Capitol is voter integrity, right? We got to uphold this quote, voter integrity in the system. And, and that's not a word that we're hearing on the ground. You don't, you don't hear that from voter mobilization groups. You're not hearing that from voters even, right? So that's when it makes you question, okay, what are the political motivations behind this? And when you talk to Republican lawmakers, they will also cite big changes spurred by, by the pandemic, right? Well, well, we never used drop boxes really before. So we need to put rules around them now, right? Because it is kind Kind of a, a newer function spurred by the pandemic. But I think that it's it's widely recognized that a lot of these changes had to come from the Republican Party because of the notions that were being pushed by the former president, that there was this widespread voter fraud, right? That he was pushing these this rhetoric even before the ballots were cast and it, it hindered the Republican Party. And it, there's evidence that it actually suppressed turnout for them, right? That there was um, so voters that didn't turn out because they didn't trust the system. So the Republican Party needed to act also on their behalf to tell show voters that, look, we are doing something to fix the system to kind of play into this big misconception that there was something wrong to begin with. Right. And, and that's what we hear from Republican lawmakers. But we know that there's this bigger forces driving the changes. It, um, voter integrity is, like you said, in some ways, voter integrity and voter suppression are two sides of the same coin in that they are uh, they are talked about by people in, you know, state capitals and and in Washington and day to day people are not using those kinds of language that can't that kind of language and they're not talking about these issues in that way um and perhaps there's an opportunity there um so i mean i kind of want to look forward with all of you and and sort of ask okay where do we go from here if the solution is perhaps participation education engagement with voters um do you see an opportunity if you were to give advice to Let's let's say uh, we're giving advice to people who are interested in, in in making our democracy better, in fortifying our democracy. What would we? What advice would we give them for how to um, to make our our democracy, our union, better when it comes to giving people better access to engage with their elected officials? Um, what, where would you start first, Isaiah? I mean, do you have a place where you go to first to say, we need to start here. This is what uh, we need to talk to people about every single day. Um, and if we do that, this is the thing that I think will get us a little bit closer to a healthier democracy. So I, 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 would, I, would, I would say two things. The, the first thing that I would, I would talk about is, um, you know, uh, birth rights into the union. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and when we talk about birth rights, uh, that, that means that we all get uplifted to Americans, uh, as opposed mm -hmm. to these apartheid racial color boxes that we, that we play in black, white, uh, you know, it, it, you know, America's got to get real about, you know, who Americans are. Uh, that would be the first thing that this political government needs to do and recognize. The second thing I would say is, you know, when you when you talk about education, the, the truest form of education is participation in observation. Right now, we have too many observers of the system, not necessarily participating in the system. 
if we can get participation in observation collectively to come together, then we can truly educate, inspire, and motivate, you know, all of our Americans to come to the ballot box and say, okay, the best man or the best woman or the best team wins, and we have true competition. And of course, you know, in the course of a game, there's going to be one team with strategy. Democrats going to have their strategy. The independents going to have strategy. The Republicans going to have strategy. Okay, who message best? What information gets out? But at least we're all playing from the same page, and the rules are the same. Right now, you know, the rules are kind of one way here, one way over here, and this system needs to come together where we all plan and reading from the same sheet of rules. Dr. Greer, do you have any thoughts? I do. <laughs> um, the <laughs> I, know, first well, I know you is... <laughs> have thoughts. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I know you have thoughts. They're all very, very smart. So give it to us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the first is um, understand um, gov uh, Civics 101, um, structures of government um, and separation of powers. Who has the ability to do what? Um, and that starts with uh, your legislative branch is the most powerful branch of government on your city, state, and federal level. It is your legislative branch. Um, to go along with that, know who your legislative representatives are. Who is your city council member? Do you have their email address or their phone number? How often do you communicate with them? Do you know who your state um, representative is, your state senator is, do you communicate with them? Let them know how you, um, you know, your thoughts and perspectives on those particular issues. And, and can then, I pause you there just to say sure. to people who, in response to what you just said, she's saying, do you have their email and phone number? Because often you can just find them on the internet. It's not like a mystery how to communicate with folks. And while you can't call your congressman here in Washington, you can probably literally pick up the phone and call the cell phone of your legislature in your home state. So make a mental note of that and literally just go and Google it and you will find it. It's right there online, an email, a phone number to reach them in some cases very, very directly. So I apologize, but continue. No, no, I thank you um, for for expanding on that. And, and, and please know they will call you back. They will email you back because they know that if you took the time to call them or email them, that you are serious. And, and if you called or emailed them, they're not the only ones you talk to about that particular issue. They think that you've talked to other people. So they want to be rehired. And um, so they will call you back. Um, and to go along with that, before I get to my last point is, understanding your power as a citizen also means that you understand you are the employer and those people with a .gov email are your employees. The only reason why they have that .gov email or they get a paycheck by you as a taxpayer is because you have hired them into office. And so if we understand that we have that power and authority to hire and fire, then, you know, maybe we would look at our elected representatives differently. Uh, my last point is I highly encourage as many people as possible from the 16 year old that you have, whether it's, you know, niece, nephew or son, daughter, as well, all the way up to yourself to consider being a poll worker. Once you understand what it's like to go through the training process um, and to actually work a poll, you are um, a, you are a, um, a voting advocate at that point. So you can dispel any types of misunderstandings about voting and the voting process. You can be an advocate for how the voting process works and then you can encourage others to do so. In addition to you can get paid to do it, um, but your the service is, is what matters because who better else to be an advocate for your community but you? Such a good point. I mean, the poll workers in this country were really the heroes of the last election because they went through a lot of changes. They dealt with a lot of crazy stuff happening. 
and they did their jobs. And these are regular everyday people like you and I, who just decided to do a public service. And every single one of you can do that if you so choose. So thank you for mentioning all of that. And Riley, you're, you see this up close and personal. Um, you know, I, I preface this by saying people, what's your advice to people who are interested in making our democracy better? I say that because this is not about whether you are a Republican or a Democrat. It's about whether or not you want our de democratic system to actually function in a way that is more effective. And so when you think about that question, I mean, what would you say to people? What do you think is the place where we can have the most, you can have the most impact if you're sitting here listening to us today? Well, I mean, if you want to see change in your community, you have to go to where the policies are being changed. And just to hammer home the point that Dr. Greer made is the state house is the most powerful place in your state. The state lawmakers there are making decisions that directly you can feel the impact of the decisions they make at a policy level in your communities. So knowing who your representatives are, knowing who to who to call, calling their offices. And I would also point to even further down ballot races as well in your local communities, being engaged with your commissions, being engaged with your local school boards, pay attention to how those things are, are reconfigured after redistricting this year, especially. You know, there will be changes at the local, very minor local level Level that you, if you're not involved in could go a way that you're not happy with. So um, paying attention to your down ballot races. And I think that will, if voter mobilization groups are rethinking how they're going to get people involved this year, it is a, a spotlight on the down ballot races and the importance that they have. One of the things that I think stops people from participating in the system is the false belief that their vote doesn't matter. And nothing matters more than your vote at the local and county level, okay? Sometimes these races are just a couple of votes, a couple hundred votes apart, and it has an impact on who's running your kid's school, who's running the board of elections where you live, um, everything about your day-to-day -day life. And so those really are the elections that matter. And I think if we talk about it differently and make the stakes different. I think we focus, I mean, I'm a national political reporter, but I do think we focus too much on what's going on here in Washington and not enough on the things that actually impact people's day-to-day -day lives. So on that, I want to thank all of you for being here, Dr. Greer, Riley Bunch, Isaiah Thomas, a great conversation, um, and maybe not what you were expecting. I mean, I do think one of the big takeaways here is that we have the power right? And there's a lot of stuff happening uh, when it comes to election laws and changes that are being made and the changes that are being made for a lot of the wrong reasons. But at the end of the day, we still have the power to cast a ballot and to uh, influence what happens in the future. And we have to use that power to make our democratic system function the way that we want it to. And I always say, I, if you watch the election system up close in this country, you'd be a little bit scared because you would think that we were living like three decades ago. Um, there are a lot of things that can be modernized about how we do this. And until we can have some consensus about some basic things, like in a society in which we could, this is a supercomputer, uh, that we should have more efficient elections. That's a basic thing that I think we can all agree on and we should start agreeing on those things. Um, but for you all watching at home, um, I hope you take everything that was said here, and I hope some of it was useful to you. I hope every single one of you goes and finds your local representatives and gets their phone number and puts in a phone call. Um, and with that, I want to thank you all again for being here, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.